things, but okay, ready to go. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our study session for this week. We are going to first hear from Marin Murphy and Terrell Black on the South Logan Transportation um, Planning Project update. Then we're going to get a very quick ARPA update from Matt Boston and myself. And then we're going to hear from our CFO, Tanya Wallace, on the 2023 budget. So Marin and Terrell, come on up. Good morning, council members. I'm Marin Murphy, and I'm going to share about um, the South Logan Transit Oriented Development Project. And I have a presentation that I'll walk through, lots of images and maps. Oh, are you doing it? Should I hit slideshow? Yep, you're good to control it from there now. Excellent. All right, well, to first start off, um, I did just want to remind um, or share with everybody that we do have a project page, web page that we are keeping up to date with all of the materials and information. Um, so that's my.spokanecity.org backslash South Logan TOD. We also have an email address uh, that people can con connect with us. And um, of course, if anyone wants to chat over the phone, we have our um, planning services phone number, 625-6500. So the South Logan TOD project, I know um, we've talked about it a little bit. I think I haven't been here since maybe June, so I thought I'd just give another high-level overview of um, what it's about. So generally, we are planning for mixed-use walkable development close to transit in the South Logan area, um, up to about one half mile from the new city line stations that are going through. Um, there are three city line stations that we're looking at, two on Cincinnati and one on Mission Avenue. The focus of the project is looking at zoning and development standards to try to um, have more transit supportive uses. Uh, we're also going to be studying the environmental impacts in the area through um, an environmental impact statement. Um, and we've already started that process. Um, and then the outcome is going to be a plan and policies based on community vision that will provide a framework uh, and recommendations for this specific study area. And it will likely result in land use changes. Uh, that's sort of the focus with the sub area plan as well as the uh, environmental impact statement. So we'll be bringing forward um, a whole package of that um, next year. And I did just want to um, quickly talk about the transit oriented development principles uh, just at a high level. Um, Overall, transit-oriented development provides a mix of supportive land uses, housing options, and destination and services linked by transit. And it focuses on safety and accessibility with walking and biking improvements. And we are also focusing on housing affordability and anti-displacement strategies in this area so that we can ensure that the benefits of transit-oriented development um, are shared by all people as well as local businesses. That's kind of one of the things we've been learning about is there's a lot of locally owned businesses in this area, so trying to um, support uh, both residents and businesses. And again, it's, it's generally focused around a, a quarter mile to half mile around station areas, so that's kind of our study area at this time. And uh, I did just want to show a recent planning timeline, just the idea that we have been building on a lot of work over the last decade. Uh, STA has been planning and constructing the city line for quite a while now, uh, scheduled to open in July 2023. And within that process, they did a lot of um, economic impact studies, um, different, different types of studies to look at how land use could support the city line and the investment that uh, STA has been making in that. Um, in 2021, the city developed a 
transit-oriented development framework study that looked at a high level of what transit-oriented development could look like in Spokane. And from that, we're kind of narrowing down to the South Logan area to um, see how we can move forward with those ideas uh, along the city line through this area. And I should also note that within this time frame, the Logan neighborhood also did their neighborhood plan and looked at um, the Hamilton corridor specifically to try to encourage um, more vibrant uses, more pedestrian um, walkability, and uh, within that adopted a form-based code along the Hamilton corridor. So our timeline, we started earlier this summer and have been working on existing conditions and that's what I'm going to update you all on today. Uh, we've been, we have an existing conditions report that I just put on the project website yesterday. Um, and then we also completed a community survey. We had a planning studio in September and then we also wrapped up our public scoping for SEPA and the environmental review as well. So um, on the timeline, we are wrapping up existing conditions and then the next step will be getting into kind of the meat of the process with looking at alternatives and doing that environmental analysis. Um, and speaking of SEPA, wanting to share again just a high level of uh, the focus that we're doing with the SEPA planned action. So the planned action is a type of project uh, where we study the environmental analysis early on in the process um, at an entire project level. And this allows us to um, simplify and expedite the environmental review of individual projects within the study area once the um, planned action and the, is adopted by council. And this really helps to create predictability uh, within the process and within the implementation of it. It helps us carry out um, be responsive to community needs so that we are planning and then also implementing um, in a timely manner. And cities that have done planned actions have seen a lot of economic development um, being driven toward these areas. So uh, that's sort of the, the intent of the planned action and um, one of the components of this project. So a simple graphic here, instead of doing again the environmental review at each individual project level, this project is going to do it at the entire study area level, and then that will allow projects that are um, consistent with this analysis to move forward in a more timely manner. Um, and if there's any questions, feel free to jump in. I, I know you guys will, but just throwing that out there. Uh, so I wanted to share again about the existing conditions, and um, as I mentioned, we do have a full report we just put on the project page yesterday. Um, it's about 80 pages, a lot of great information. But generally, the existing conditions report helps assess existing conditions for a study area. We're looking at um, land use, utilities, um, kind of the built environment, natural environment. And it's really helping us set up the environmental review and understanding the infected environment for that environmental review. So it's an important document that will help us um, build on the analysis as we go forward. Um, and so I wanted to share some of the data from that. There's a lot more in here, but I'm just gonna touch on some of the high level. So first off, I wanted to talk about um, resident and household characteristics. So there's just about 4,600 residents in the area. The median age is quite young at 22 years, um, namely due to Gonzaga and the students living in the area. But we also do have a considerable population of elderly residents as well as people with disabilities, so kind of both ends of the spectrum there. Um, there are a few senior housing um, apartments and facilities in the area, so um, that may be contributing to that as well as older homeowners. A quarter of the residents are below sorry, just over a quarter of the residents are below the poverty level, uh, which could be both a long-term status as well as kind of a temporary status. Um, um, sometimes students may have a lower income while they're in college, and so that could be contributing to that number as well. Um, a large number of households are without a vehicle, just over 20%. And probably not a surprise, um, but almost 
90% of the housing units in the area are rental, again, probably due to the large student population. Uh, Logan neighborhood is a fairly diverse neighborhood and we see some of that reflected in the study area, which is a subsection of the Logan neighborhood. Um, kind of of note is the Latino Hispanic population is about seven and a half percent, which is higher than the city overall. We also looked at the social, social vulnerability index and this is an index that the Center for Disease Control puts out every two years to look at uh, vulnerability by census tract related to these four um, kind of grouped factors, socioeconomic status, household composition, disability, minority status and language, housing type and transportation. So this is data that we've just pulled from this um, Center for Disease Control and are just highlighting the project area within that, which is rated as moderate to high vulnerability, so not the highest vulnerability. Um, but still moderate, and a lot of that is coming from the socioeconomic status and then the household type and transportation. Uh, businesses and institutions in the area. This is an a old historic photo from, um, or aerial from, I think, 1958. So you can see the railroad still through there. A lot of, uh, a lot of the area was historically manufacturing and industrial. Um, railroad, logging. Uh, currently, 80% of the employees in the study area are employed by locally owned businesses, which I think is a really cool um, and important data point for this, uh, for this study area and something that we're talking a lot about and how to preserve the local businesses as redevelopment may occur. Uh, and of course, Gonzaga is the dominant employer with about 45% of the total employees, but there are a number of notable employers in the area as well. Um, this is just a map of major nodes and landmarks and it's kind of identifying strategic spots in the study area that's sort of the circles or nodes and then landmarks which are key characteristics that help make the area unique. Um, and so we see major intersections along Hamilton and Mission. Sharp is also um, kind of another major area uh, obviously landmarks around Gonzaga, Mission Park. Um, I did put a star there at Jack and Dan's, could be considered a landmark. Um, mm -hmm. And then a lot of pathways through there, both um, vehicle pathways as well as uh, pedestrian and bicycle pathways. Um, the area in the north is generally housing, some student housing, um, some retail, and then the area in the south is a lot of that manufacturing and warehouse still. Um, we have the emergence of the Health Peninsula at the very southern point with the new UW Medical School, um, Gonzaga University Health Partnership, as well as some retail um, along the Riverwalk. Just some pictures of the area. I'm sure you all are familiar with it, but ranging from Gonzaga to the Spokane River, um, Mission Park, student housing, single family housing, a lot of different retail. Um, and Sharp, just as a note, uh, went through a redesign a couple of years ago to have bioswales and um, enhance connectivity across Sharp, which uh, helps with students going to and from school. And speaking of that, um, this is just a map of the pedestrian and bicycle routes, a little bit probably hard to see here. Again, this is in the, the full um, existing conditions report, but of course we have the Centennial Trail that goes through the area, uh, as well as the Cincinnati Greenway, that's a new north-south corridor uh, that is focused for bicycles. And then just a lot of other um, pedestrian networks and existing bike networks as part of our uh, bicycle master plan. Transit service, uh, there are a number of STA routes currently through the area, and once the city line is, um, is opened up, it really will be one of the most transit-rich areas outside of downtown, which is going to be a really exciting uh, feature in this area. And then kind of following that, the street network, um, is interesting because Hamilton has a pretty um, high traffic load. Uh, the average annual daily traffic is over 30,000. 
Um, and you can see it kind of drops down a little bit once it passes mission, and then mission is about 17 to 19,000. Uh, but a lot of traffic coming off of uh, the freeway there and people using it to travel through. So that's been a big discussion point that we've had a lot about. Uh, zoning and design regulations, there's a lot on this map and I'm not gonna talk through all of it. I think the point of it is, is that there's a lot on this map. There's a lot of different zones in the area. We still have single family and two family zones just you know, within Gonzaga and north of Gonzaga. And then um, centers and corridors and at parts along Hamilton, we have the context area, which is the form-based code that's part of that Logan neighborhood plan. Uh, there's general commercial in the south part that is the warehousing area, and that is a very open-ended zoning designation that allows for a lot of or auto-oriented uses, which is one of the driving motivations of the Logan neighborhood plan back in 2013 was to try to promote more walkability, uh, more pedestrian safety, more vibrancy. Um, so this is one of the areas that we're studying and looking at, um, but I just wanted to throw up the zoning map as kind of the existing condition. Um, current transportation projects, I'm sure you all are familiar with them. City Line, obviously, the Don Cardong Bridge rebuild. The East Trent Bridge construction has been going on for a number of years with WashDOT, um, and hopefully that'll be wrapping up soon, but that's been a lot of construction in the area. Um, other development over uh, um, kind of the last couple years as well as recently, the Matilda building was um, probably the newest uh, private residential development along Hamilton, one floor or ground floor retail and then three floors of residential above that. Uh, we also had an opportunity to tour the Joya Child and Family Development Center, which is a really beautiful facility. Um, and they, their long-term vision was focused on being in this area um, for 30, 40 years. Um, so they're really excited to be close to the universities, kind of within this health, um, higher education focus. Um, so that's a really great asset there. And then, of course, the new UW Medical School, Gonzaga University Health Partnership, very long name, um, but $60 million building investment in the area as well. Uh, a little bit about community engagement. Again, we are online. That's where we're keeping a lot of our, or all of our information up to date there, um, the project webpage. We also launched a story map, uh, which is an online platform that allows people to navigate through this information on their own time. Um, there's videos, um, images, uh, narrative, kind of a, a cool experience. So that's on the project webpage as well. We did just finish a community survey, so I wanted to share a little bit about that. Um, it was open for about four months and was really an attempt to sort of get early engagement and feedback um, as people heard about the project. So we shared it um, a lot through the community update and helped us really build our stakeholder list and interested individual list. Um, just a few data points from here. A lot of people visit the area for food and drink. Um, also traveling through, uh, we had 41% of respondents live in the area. Um, and three quarters of the respondents either visit the area daily or a few times a week. And one of our questions we asked was about what would your ideal future look like for the South Logan area? So we see a lot of um, words around friendly, walkable, safe, vibrant, accessible, uh, those are all concepts that are part of the transit-oriented development framework, and so it's exciting to see people are thinking along those lines as well. And the full summary, is a lot more data in here. This is also on the website, but I just wanted to kind of give a few points there. So we also did a community planning studio for three days in September at the Sear building, which is at the southern portion of the study area. It's a really beautiful building. Um, we're really excited to be there, and we had uh, two community meetings, three different work groups, um, and it was open for three days. Had some really great discussions, a lot of good input uh, from residents and community members that stopped by. We also hosted a forum with the Gonzaga Student Body Association Senate. It was about 30 students that um, are from all different um, university levels, and we did some mapping activities and 
um, polling and discussion. We really wanted to, we've been working with Gonzaga at a high level, but we really wanted to try to get within Gonzaga and talk to the students specifically, so that was a really great opportunity. And we learned a lot from them on how they use the area, where they see issues or challenges are, and what opportunities they would like to see uh, as they think about future students that might be in the area. Hey, Maren. Yeah. Did you uh, happen to, to uh, have any conversation with kind of administration at Gonzaga around what you're doing or housing in general? Yeah, we are. We are working um, at the high level. Um, Chuck Murphy, the chief strategy officer, we've um, been having a number of conversations with him, and he came to the community planning studio. Um, so we are on that high level, and then this was an attempt to get more on the individual level. No, that, that's great. I've, I've been deficient in talking with them, but I went to a forum that they had last January talking about housing, and one of my hopes that they didn't really talk too much about was that they would think more about more on-campus housing options, um, especially to help because of the crisis that we have around the community. Um, it, it wasn't something that was top of their mind at that point, but I think more conversation might might get them to do something more. Yeah, and um, they are, that was part of the conversation that we heard from them of um, wanting to house more of their students. And then internally, a lot of their student housing isn't equal across their experience is what we've heard. So they are trying to update their housing, um, just the different ages of the dorms. And um, they don't have a lot of housing for upper kind of junior, senior level, and then grad students. And so they do, they have communicated that is a focus. Um, so from all the conversations, uh, this is a, a general kind of concept map, but um, there's been um, discussion of different sort of transformational areas. And um, the southern portion has been talked a lot about that warehouse of seeing more of a, transfer a transformation to mixed use over time. Um, so as redevelopment may occur, how could we um, encourage more mixed-use development, more kind of destination-oriented development. Um, the Gonzaga students were super excited about the thought of like a mini downtown or a downtown Logan, just some place where they can go and explore and hang out more. Um, no lies down there, global neighborhood thrift, and trying to build off of that and see, um, you know, more, more retail, more mixed-use development there, um, and, and housing as well. Um, housing is a big focus of this too. Hey, um, and then, sorry, yeah. one more on that. I think uh, I'm curious, and I'm trying to see the boundaries if I can tell. But you know, I know there are some areas in Logan where we have these just incredibly wide streets um, that go back, you know, a long time. And it seems like there'd be a lot of really cool opportunity to just to do something either unique uh, with those areas. Um, and I'm just curious, have, has that been a focal point at all with the studies that you're doing? Yes, absolutely. And cool. that's um, trying to understand. Yeah, exactly, what we could do there. Um, some of the right-of-ways are, are quite large in this area. Um, and then as you move north, um, some incremental change, but we want to see more transit-supportive uses, so how can we encourage um, a different mix of density up there, possibly, um, and again, more housing that uh, would allow people to live close to transit and have those benefits. So some emerging concepts uh, so far, and these will kind of filter into the alternatives as we're developing them. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, as I mentioned, along Hamilton Street specifically, whether it's driving, walking, just the overall connectivity. Um, so not saying one way or another, but just people have a lot of thoughts of, along Hamilton and that experience there. Uh, we've heard a lot about bicycle and pedestrian connections. Um, I mentioned some of the levels of change in the residential areas. Right now, the residential areas is single family and two family. Um, so could there be um, different types of housing as we look at different zoning um, categories? Um, and then what is that range that might be considered? Uh, we've also heard about minimizing displacement of longer term residents and local businesses. And I'll be back in December to talk more about this. Our consultant is preparing a memo about anti-displacement strategies and um, affordability strategies. And so we're going to dive deeper into that. Um, but that is a concept that has come out so far. Um, mentioned the warehouse redevelopment 
uh, or the mixed use redevelopment in that kind of southern warehouse area, the zoning categories. There's also been talk of side streets, so kind of getting off of Columbus or off of Hamilton um, towards the east. There's some streets, Columbus and Springfield, that might provide an opportunity to draw people off of Hamilton and maybe create more of um, some local. Uh, local destinations, um, kind of commercial activity there. And also just generally having the area have a neighborhood feel. It is part of Logan neighborhood, um, but with Hamilton coming through and the high amount of traffic um, and, and frankly a large student population, um, wanting it to have more of a neighborhood feel. And so what can we do to help support that and enhance that feel? Um, I will also mention we did our public scoping, which is related to our environmental impact statement process, and that is a mandatory review period at the beginning of the process to help define the scope of the analysis. Um, so we began that in early September, and it was open for about six weeks. We tied it into our community planning studio with a community meeting um, and sent out a scoping notice, um, and so we received five scoping comments. Um, from WASHDOT, STA, um, Spokane Tribe, the Department of Ecology, and our streets department. So those will help inform the process in addition to all of the other input we've gotten as well. So our next steps, um, again, we have our project updates on the website. Um, our community survey is up there, the existing conditions report, the story map, um, upcoming presentations. I'm gonna be um, at the Logan Neighborhood Council meeting next week to share an update uh, and then plan commission as well next week, um, continuing the discussion around market research and then oh, um, some early discussions of the anti-displacement strategies. And then, like I said, I'll be back here in December to dive into those topics a bit more. And then once we get that, we move into the next stage, which is our draft alternatives. And so we'll be bringing a larger package at a later date to really dig through all of that and we'll probably have some more study sessions then. So that is all. All right, exciting. Thanks for the presentation and all of you who've been working on that. Um, we are, I'm just gonna discuss this ARPA update, it's a small one. So the ARPA committee has been, uh, we got some requests from the administration, we've asked for more information about it and then we have Several items that have just been pending that council rated pretty highly and of course we're kind of at the getting close to the end of the ARPA money and so we're waiting to get that information from the administration and we'll come back to you. But we had one thing that we thought we could get out the door which is the firehouse uh, that the fire department has requested and our recommendation is to um, give them the $100,000 for the actual house and not the truck yet. We're still exploring exploring that and there's a long wait time on getting new trucks anyway but anyway so that's so it's this we've been calling it skinny tranche four and there were like four other things now it's the skinniest of skinny it's just the one thing but we didn't think we should wait on that but so we should just get that out yeah do we do we know that the hundred is enough to cover the cost of the actual house they, they haven't updated their cost since February of 21 they, they told me it was 200 for the house no that was with the vehicle that included the trailer yeah okay and everything. We'll, so we'll check back with we, them. We asked them, and they said they haven't done any updates because okay. inflation and stuff like that. Well, full, fully support moving ahead, but yeah. I want to make sure we have the right. Okay, get the right number. All right, we'll find out. Just, uh, just a quick note, in addition to updating that number, the SBO that's in the packet, I inadvertently left some lang old language in there too, so I'll update that before it's filed too. <laughs> All right, we've got Tanya Wallace coming up. I'm sure you've been working late hours and weekends. Um, That's you. And your team, thanks for coming. I had one question before we started. I just, I had the media advisory from Brian Coddington that says it's a balanced budget, but I'm, that can mean different things to other people. What I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of in terms of balance is the general fund operational spending is at match the general fund operational revenues for 2023, or are we, planning on dipping into other funds that have accumulated. Um, that's, 
So to me, a balanced budget is okay. Okay, the outputs and the inputs are the are the same, but that might not be the definition he was using. I'm just um, balanced um, means resources against expenditures in most terms. Um, but you are correct. It could also mean inflows versus outflows. Um, it could mean both. But in terms of presenting a balanced budget, yes, we have resources to cover all of the expenses right. that are proposed in the budget. But how much of the resource to cover the expenses were accumulated resources as opposed to ones we think were? I know we're going to get historical high tax collections projected. I'm just wondering how many millions are we dipping into the other accumulated funds, roughly? If, or if it's already covered, then when you get to it. But Most of it is covered in the, in the presentation. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move along. So I'm going to give you um, some highlights here, and I'm sure that we can have many more conversations um, over the next month or so as you deliberate. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about the citywide budget that the mayor's proposed, a little bit about the general fund, some of the budget documents, the next steps, and I will cover, um, as you had requested, a little bit of a response on the resolution that was um, approved about two weeks ago. Um, so some of the highlights. Certainly the biggest highlight is investing in people. The biggest investment has been in employees. And of course, over the summer, we've had eight open labor agreements. There is still at least the guild that is underway. So it was a very busy, compact summer between opening track and negotiating numerous labor agreements. But the biggest investment is our employees and into our neighborhoods, um, certainly with our public works, our capital projects, how we're investing there, as well as our most vulnerable homelessness population. Um, the mayor has also proposed funding for homelessness. And we presented a strategy for you on the 13th of October as well. Um, enhanced physical health and safety of the community. In the general fund, over 52% of our general fund is allocated just to public safety, just fire and police. So that doesn't include municipal court or our legal services, because that would increase that amount. But also our fire and police are funded not just from the general fund, they're also public, from the public safety levy and the EMS levy. So many more dollars actually go towards those services than just what's in the general fund. We also um, unite our fire dispatch now with the regional rest of the dispatch. So that is presented and proposed in this budget as well. Um, plans for additional firefighters, according to that labor agreement, we will be adding about 30. We are also studying that to really make sure that 30 is the right number before we get all the way to that point. Um, supports staffing structure to enhance police patrol. So you did hear from Chief Meidel on his proposed restructuring to put more officers into patrol. Um, strategic one-time use of revenues and resources. And council member, this does get to your, your point of, yes, as we start to emerge out of the pandemic, um, and we have lost 37 million is our latest estimate um, in revenue. We are projecting and proposed to use a little more than 2.6 million of unappropriated fund balance. Um, now I want to remind council too though, in 2021, the adopted budget also proposed about a million dollars of unappropriated fund balance. Um, and it's been used historically in the past as well. Provides funding to ensure shelter beds. That's probably one of the next largest investments that we have um, as well as for our shelter providers to transition to a post-pandemic funding level. As we discussed on October 13th, this does take a little bit of time and we do need to help educate and work with our providers to see what a post-pandemic environment looks like. And of course, the real intent is to move them into housing. And we all know that it ta it's taking a little bit longer to build those rooftops and make them available. So citywide resources. You can see here total citywide, the budget is about 1.3 billion um, in total resources, or yeah, resources, we have that much available. About 300,000, 300 million, excuse me, of that is really coming from retained earnings or fund balance. Only 2.6, again, is the general fund. But it is common practice for a lot of our enterprise funds, for example, 
to actually retain earnings intentionally for plant capital. And so that's what that use is, about 21% of our resources. Could you go going. back, you gave us the 2.6 million from the unappropriated fund. How much for the homeless initiative one time, how many millions of dollars is that? That would be seven million. Okay. And is that anticipated to also be in 2024 or will those housing units be built that we won't have to do that? Well, the strategy for 2024 is that that funding would be reduced down pretty substantially um, for 2024. Now, the strategy was saying about three million by 2024, and then we'd ramp down again. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, when we looked at proposed expenditure of 1.2 billion, there are really a couple big pots. We have the general fund, which we all focus on. It is our most flexible fund. 68% is our restricted funds. So these are our dedicated funds, our fiduciary funds, our enterprise funds. They're restricted for specific uses. Um, and then we have capital. Capital is about 13% of that total number. So citywide expenditure category. This kind of breaks it down by category. And you can see salary and employee benefits and then services, so these are all the contractual services that we put out, out there, um, capital outlay, debt service, transfers, um, and then budget reserves. Here's a little breakdown so that you can kind of see between the different funds. On the left, you see the fund category. Um, you can see some of the, the biggest increase is our special revenue funds. That is still largely from federal grants that are coming in. That is also where your fire EMS fund is, where we did renew that EMS levy. So you're seeing that renewed up to the 50 cents per thousand of assessed market value. And then you see your next two largest in your enterprise funds and your internal service funds, and that is largely for capital. That's the biggest change there. But across all the funds, you are seeing increases, and that's largely in the personnel when you're looking at just the operations, again, because of the labor agreements. So, Tanya, with those record increases, where are we allocating reserves to replace some of the funds that have been used? Or are we there to replace, to put money back that we have been taking out of our reserves? Um, if, I, if I understand, so there is no set aside in the general fund to help rebuild unappropriated and unassigned mm -hmm. reserves. Um, typically, if you'd like to increase the contingency reserve, that would be, or ha establish another reserve. Otherwise, those are unassigned, unappropriated. And those could fluctuate to any level that, that, that you wish. But in the budget, there is no mm -hmm. set aside to help rebuild those. The plan is to use some of those. When we look at staffing, you can see that the change from the adopted 22 to what's proposed is an increase of 51 FTEs. Those are largely the 30 firefighters are added in that, and then a lot in the public works funds. There was about 13 positions through public works, solid waste, um, development services, and then there was a little bit of a trade-off with fire dispatch going out, police dispatch coming in, and there were a few changes that were made in the interim after the 22 budget was adopted, but just a handful of those. So looking at the general fund, um, funding resources, 229. This is where it is balanced. It does include, you can see down there in the bottom right corner, fund balance. Its fund balance and use of that is less than 1% of the entire general fund expenditures. Um, even at the end of a fiscal year, between 1% and 3% margin of error is, is typical. And then general fund by division. This is where you can see the 52% for just fire and police. And just to make this most evident, um, 
fire is an allocation. We actually transfer it out into the fire EMS fund, but I wanted to break down those allocations for you here so that you're really seeing ultimately where are we spending our money. So you can see also library, that's an allocation, but 4% of our budget goes to library. Um, we also send to parks, so parks says 7% here. Now by charter, we give them 8%, but it's 8% two years looking back. It's 8% of the actuals from two years previous. So yeah, two years with the cost increases, it does appear to be a little bit less. Here's that breakdown again, so you can see the actual numbers where you see police at $73 million, fire at 46. But again, both these departments receive funding from other sources, the criminal justice fund, small part, but largely the public, sa public um, safety levy fund and then the EMS fire. Um, just fire between general fund and the EMS, their total budget is up to 69 million in to total there. Um, and then you see public works, streets and utilities, and parks, courts, and you can see. I'm gonna draw your attention to that bottom one that says other. That is the large grouping of really small departments that are under three million. So that would include city council office, certainly finance and administration, the hearing examiner, the mayor's office, clerk's office, we have several of them that are much smaller, under three million. Um, combined, they make about 13.5%. So some of the strategic proposals that are in there, and there is a detailed listing of items that have been added, is certainly the employee compensation increases for, according to all of the, the approved labor agreements. Homelessness services, again, that's seven million from the affordable housing is the strategy and that is what is put into the budget for your consideration. <coughs> Public safety. Um, we did present to you how we calculated overtime and made some, some different changes to address overtime differently in the budget. So those are higher budget amounts than what we have historically budgeted. We also looked at some of their pay adjustments, did some analysis there and so those budgets um, are intended to be more reflective of what we think will really happen. And then several dispatch changes, many of which you have just heard about in the last couple weeks that are going on there. Development services staffing, and then certainly utility services support and additional staffing there. Again, solid waste, um, sewer, and then some administration and project support as there. As the city continues to grow and we're adding more, it does take more administration. The biggest administration enhancement is adding a position for the clerk's office uh, because of public records requests that are coming in. They are months and months behind in responding to those. Is it, is it development services an enterprise fund? So yes, it is. So is it, it's not coming from the general fund? No. Okay. You're correct there. So, um, Council, we've also presented to you in, in the last several weeks, um, so we've presented to you on homelessness. We've tried to hit the highlights um, for you. Homelessness, public safety, staffing, um, reserves, and the difference between unassigned and restricted and unrestricted and some of that information. We would, I know that it's still a concern about capital improvement planning, and so we would like to start an education process with you to get your feedback and start a prioritization process with capital. Um, but I do want to take a few minutes to respond to the, to the resolution. So the first one does not include ARPA. We do have a very, we have a special revenue fund for ARPA. Everything is tracked in that fund. We have included in the budget the appropriation of what is still unallocated, because remember we started this back in August, September with this budget. Um, however, it is not in any specific program. That would wait until you have allocated to a specific program and then we would put it into that program. So that is just intended to be a placeholder and nothing more. 
um, so contains at least a 10% reduction in general fund expenses. This budget does not include a 10% reduction in general fund expenses. Um, the use of fund balance represents less than 1% of the entire general fund that is proposed in this budget. Um, our proposal is to work with you over the next several months through 2023 to really get back to basics, get back to our core services, and then make sure that we're doing them as efficiently and effectively as possible. Um, and really target that we're within, like I said, a, a margin of error in projections is between one and 3%. We're there now with this budget, but I understand your concerns and with growing, growing costs, um, we need to stay confined to that, and, and we do need to bring service level options to you, but we also need to take the time to build those up and have those discussions and bring them forward. Tanya, if you were, um, or if we were putting together uh, a biennial budget or longer, um, like a four year, like the legislature has to do now, without any sort of reductions, um, would it balance? No, sir. So how, I mean, I guess, is your thought in terms of the, the uh, structural gaps then to identify reductions or what, how, what, what's exactly the goal of, of that process? Um, the ultimate goal is to identify solutions. I don't want to say reductions because in some cases we aren't charging fees where we maybe should be charging fees. So maybe instead of a service reduction, we're going to charge for a service at a more acceptable fee level. So it's a combination of looking at all of that. In some cases, it will be a service reduction. Um, we may find that we're providing services that aren't core to a city, and we should discuss that. And that is a policy discussion um, that, that we need to have. So the intent is really like, let's just, let's, in the next, over the next three years, what is it going to take to get that gap closed? And what solutions can we bring to you? What options can we bring to you? And like I said, some cases it's not going to be a service reduction. It's going to be a service fee change. And then one, one more question. Sorry, I don't want to take mm -hmm. you off track of this, but in terms of the, the projected revenue, did I, I want to make sure I heard correctly. Did somebody said that we are projected to have record breaking revenues next year? Is that, did I hear that correctly? Or did I miss here? I said that. Oh, you said that's that. That's my understanding. Is, is, is that, that is that accurate? Projected. Are we projected to have record-breaking revenues next year? Um, th those are those are not my words. <laughs> no, I, I'm just asking. I mean, yeah. are we projected to have significant? But historically, as far as the amount of property tax and sales tax combined, will that be the most property and sales tax that we've ever collected? Yes, and that's been the case though every year except for 2020 when we dropped. Yeah three and a half percent in revenue. Otherwise, yeah, revenue keeps climbing. So yeah, 2023 revenue is gonna be more than well, 2022. So let me, let me ask it a different way. I guess, how are, we, how are we projecting what the revenue will be next year? Because there are a lot of unknowns. And so I'm just, I'm just curious how we're projecting out um, the anticipated amount of revenue for next year, particularly sales tax. Particularly sales tax. So um, Jake Miller did give a presentation on, on revenue, but sales tax, although it seems like it is high, it is really not. We have over 8% inflation and we've seen significant increases in just that and folks are still spending their money. So we're projecting actually a retraction if you just assumed every, just because of inflation. Um, we have had record attendance at events this summer. Um, so we're just taking all of that into account and still being conservative, but pr higher prices are bringing yeah. in more revenue. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, we, we will, we're definitely going to be watching that. One of the, one of the bigger changes that has happened too in the revenue that is on interest. Our LGIP rate is going up and the last couple, just the last two months in interest income, we've seen a significant jump there. Um, but we are watching it very carefully, and we will bring to you quarterly adjustments if that is if that is what we see. And then, sorry, just one last. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that we put in the letter um, was the idea of you know coming back mid-year and making adjustments next year. Is that something that 
the administration is open to doing? Yes, yes, that is on our next slide. Oh, all right. All right. Um, Before you leave the slide, yes. I just one quick question on the ARPA. I, I appreciated that you're, you've got the money in the balance sheet, but it's not allocated to programs. The one issue that I keep hearing differing views, council set aside 3 million or 3.5 million of ARPA for homelessness, but we haven't done the RFP yet for that. And we've been waiting to negotiate with CHHS on that. Is any money from that bucket allocated to programs in this budget? The 3.5 million is allocated for homelessness. And we should probably have a discussion on that really, really soon. But is it allocated to a specific homeless program? I know at the topic we agreed, but we haven't agreed on specifically how to allocate it. And so I'm wondering in this budget, is it allocated to a contract or a preventer? Or Not in 2023, because if it's been allocated already and it's in 2022, whatever is left unspent but committed, it will roll over into 2023 23 through the year end process, the encumbrance process. But we haven't allocated it even for 2022 in terms of what specifically it goes to as a council. We not were, specifically, so we've been, but council president, we will have to have probably a conversation okay. offline about that. Okay, so it sounds like it has been being spent, but even though we were not gonna get- Right, else. none, none of that you have allocated right now, this is only, I believe it's like 11 million or 13 million is all that's in 23 that is unallocated that you haven't done an SBL for. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so number so three, Tanya, yes, yes, I just have to ask on the administration proposes a service program review. That sounds good, but what kind of structure? I mean, you just can't put that in there and ask us to bite off on it if there isn't some type of uh, loose plan that you could present to council of what that would look like. Uh, going forward, since it hasn't happened, I'm just trying. What will be different in a few right. months than what's going on right now? Because that's what we've been asking for, kind of all year long, as that review, and that wasn't available to us. So. Um, Councilmember Wilkerson, I have asked um, Hannah Lee and Council President for some time for study session, okay. and that is the very specific topic of a, of the December of a December study session okay so that we can get your feedback and provide kind of a structure a plan um, and you you can understand what is coming and give us feedback to say is that going to hit the mark or not right. thank you mm -hmm. uh, Tanya real quick quick question is so back to the sales tax revenue question for next year what is the sales tax percentage increase that you're projecting like off the, the top of my head don't or know, somewhere? Off the top of my head, oh, okay. I would have to say maybe 5.6, but that is a rough estimate. I don't recall the exact number after looking at very many, okay. a lot of You'll numbers. You'll get back to us on that, please? Um, yeah, I oh, think, I, I believe it's in Jake's presentation that he gave just a week ago. Okay. Uh, and then overall, I'm just a little confused still. So we are expecting revenue to be kind of slight increase, I guess, but expenses are going up um, and we're talking about long term over three years cutting back to core services but we're increasing right now the amount that we're going to withdraw from the unallocated reserves more than previously it was a million previously and now it's 2.6 million so why aren't we cutting back to core services right now if we know that's the issue right now why is this budget not cutting back to core services now um, the only answer that I would have is that the demand for service is there now. In fact, we're being very challenged in meeting the demand for service. Um, we, if you look at our, our out-of-grade pay, which we're still reviewing, mm -hmm. out-of-grade pay, you look at overtime, it's a very clear indicator that service demand is tremendously high. And that takes more of a public discussion mm -hmm. of which services do we cut back, and then how is it gonna be impacted to the citizens? Shouldn't we have been doing that for like the last six months as we prepare for the budget? Um, again, it was a very busy summer. I don't yeah. have all the answers oh. to that. We were negotiating eight labor agreements. Um, some of this is the result of those labor agreements that the outcome just happened within the last three months 
And, and so that was unknown what that was going to come out to be. In addition, we were really trying to open track. So it's all resources are focused on the current latest burning fires at the time. And I would just add, I've also heard that there are certain departments that um, have had to hire employees and pay them um, out of grade or add to pay just because the workloads are so high. So I mean, I, I don't know how much money that amounts to, but I know that that's been a big deal with some departments. And HR I, yeah. and civil service kind of lagging behind and trying to get caught up too. Right. Yeah. And I just want to note, I just want to acknowledge, you are the messenger. You, yeah. You're not the one yeah, that yeah. makes that. I just want to be clear. I, we appreciate your coming and those are, uh, you know, mayor, mayoral decisions, not CFO decisions. You just have to translate those Thank decisions you. to us. So I just want to acknowledge that and appreciate the, your presentation. So. Um, on number three, public safety um, capital, the resolution did say include any requested. Um, truth is, is we have never been had the ability to fund any capital request. Um, the city has been very smart about what it does fund. And this is a priority-based budget that says we fund the highest priorities, we don't fund all of them. And they're not all priorities. Um, so the 2023 capital budget, which is only the first year of that plan, which is in the budget, it includes everything that is funded. And that is where we have identified the funding. We have a reasonable assurance that it's there for 23, which starts in two months, um, to start ordering um, equipment. Unfunded projects do require financial strategy. So they're not part of 2023 budget. But again, we've requested time to start that process with you. And, and I think that process really needs to start, just again, just my opinion, the process really needs to start with getting you really familiar with the requests that are in there and giving you ample time to ask questions about the projects and then in a collaboration of what are those project priorities. If we understand the priorities, we can then bring forward better funding strategies for the priorities. But uh, amongst the, the projects that are um, unfunded, are there any that we expect that we will have to fund in 23? Um, we may have to have a funding strategy established in 23 to hit the mark. Because I just want to make sure it's, you know, we're not going to be surprised come June and suddenly it's like, oh, we've got to buy these, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. or we've got to invest in this. And, oh, we've known all along, but we just didn't have a funding source. So we didn't put it in the budget. And so I just want to make sure we avoid any surprises like that. And, and, and I, I think we, we all want to avoid surprises like that, which is next Thursday, if, if we do have time, was just the intent of here are those projects. Not looking at 23, but here are the ones that were deferred or unfunded um, because we don't want you to be surprised. It does take time to, it does take time to build these financial strategies. Yep. Sometimes it will take months. Even a simple SIP loan takes three months on average to get it done from start to finish. The challenge, so, the, the challenge though is what's happened in the last year is we get presented with an emergency. Like mm -hmm. if you don't do this, what we're saying, if there's emergencies that we know are coming up, we would like them now so that we can make other cuts now before we've committed and told people, yes, you have a position or not. You know, th This is our time where we could make adjustments over a year's worth of spending to pay for an emergency if we know. That, that's, I think, and you, there are some emergencies that you can't anticipate, so we understand that. But, but what we're looking for over the next few weeks, and we can cover it in another session, is what, what are we going to hear from fire and police, essentially, that says, this, this will be an emergency if you don't fund it in 2023. So we know that and we can make other adjustments as opposed to go, oh, well, we've got enough. We can do something. We don't absolutely have to, but we will. It's a good idea. The public wants it. And then we're in a jam. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Yes. Yeah, I, I completely understand, Council President. And I, I just want to, if I remember correctly, haven't we heard you say that buyers expecting $5 million in equipment that they're going to be needing as high demand in the next year? don't think that's in the 23 budget. And I don't think I said that. All right. And police vehicles, I want to get back to police vehicles, our favorite topic. That is not included in the budget, so that's not going to be a high demand issue next year. 
I can't say that it's not going to be an issue next year. But so, we did allocate a lot of money yes. already. Yes, ready, right. right. But and for the, a future, going to come in. I was like, I know the police keep saying we need to purchase in advance, so that next year we need to purchase next I year for two. I do know that we are expecting to get quite a few of the police vehicles delivered in January, which is a little bit ahead of schedule. Right. So we are planning for. Um, we're ramping up right now of a commissioning strategy. Right. But the mayor's proposal does not plan on asking for a new purchase of police vehicles next year. It's not in her proposed budget. Okay, so not a top priority. Um, number four provides a longer term public safety capital facility plan. Um, we, again, propose that we not just look at public safety, but we have a lot of facility needs as well that don't don't get a good look um, and also have a lot of needs. For example, the City Hall roof is a $1.3 million project. Um, we know MLK Center has some, some needs. We need to look at our facilities as well. And every fa new facility, every facility we take on brings on preventative maintenance, brings on a set of capital um, items as well. So. We do want to get in front of you, and like I said, I would like to start as soon as next Thursday just to say, here are the projects. Give you some soak time, get familiar with the projects, and then work with you um, on what are the priorities for you, because then we can bring you a good financial strategy around those priorities. There are different strategies depending on what the capital item is. Um, ties um, additional ARPA revenue replacement allocations to permanent cuts in positions for 2023. Um, I think we'd like to work with you for clarification because this, this didn't, this was confusing. This didn't make sense. And I would say, for example, where, where the mayor has proposed funding for fire and police overtime, our interpretation would mean then you're looking for cuts in fire and police that are permanent. Not, not necessarily fire and police, mm -hmm. but we're looking, mm -hmm. in order to make sure that that's a one-time piece, we need to create going forward what the revenue stream is to continue to fund fire and police over time. And so if it's tied to permanent elimination of positions, then we'll know, okay, we'll, we'll that'll cover. It doesn't have to be, we didn't, we weren't saying it had to be in fire and police. But. So maybe a rephrasing is, is, if I can, Council President, is if ARPA funding is being used for operations, base operations, you'd be looking for that replacement. But if it is one time, is there still a cut? No, it, what it is is we're saying we're doing a one, we're trying to make sure that the ARPA is that we're spending one is one time. And the only way okay. we can think to do that based on now two years in a row of fire overtime is that we say, okay, we will show you for this $100,000, there's $100,000 in positions that have been eliminated, so we'll be able to accumulate that $100,000 over the next year for when we have to pay overtime again. Okay, that, that makes more sense. But not by department, it could be across the enterprise. Yeah. Um, establish a contra account hiring freeze status for 2023 for positions. Um, the 2023 budget proposed by the mayor does include contra accounts um, in, in the general fund. It amounts to nearly $4 million, and that equates to essentially freezing a little more than 28 positions. How many of those are the firefighters that you weren't going to add till July, or is that most of it? Um, the firefighters are in a different fund, so it doesn't include any of them. Okay. Um, number seven, reestablish a health, I think healthy, I'm sorry, I got a typo there, healthy unassigned reserve balance of 10 to 15 percent. Unrestricted, as we've presented to you, um, reserves already exceed more than 10 percent now, and that is not even including <coughs> the unappropriated, unassigned fund balance. Um, now, I have asked for a completely third party opinion of 
would us using our unappropriated fund balance hurt our bond rating? I don't have that opinion yet, but I will certainly <laughs> provide it to you um, when I get that. I, I'm, I'm not, so when I'm looking, when we're saying unassigned reserves, 10 to 15%, what, what's the difference between our phrase of unassigned reserves and unrestricted reserves? Because I, I thought we were going to be down to like, Two or so, three million by the end of this calendar year yeah. in unassigned reserves. Under under GASB and GFOA recommendations, they look at unrestricted. So unrestricted includes your committed, your assigned, and your unassigned. So the so, contingency reserve and the revenue, yes. you're including that as the unrestricted. Is that yes? Okay. Because that's what GASB and okay. um, GFOA look at. Okay. That is also what the rating agencies look okay. at, is restricted versus okay. unrestricted. Unassigned okay. is a component of unrestricted. Okay. All right. Well, I, I understand your language. Our request was for the unassigned to get back up to the 10 to 15%. But so you're not, you're not saying that we're at 10% for unassigned, it's just if you count those other reserve funds in that. Right. Okay. Right. Tanya, real quick, on the third party um, opinion about bond rating, have mm -hmm. you, is that also gonna include Moody's or S&P as they do the bond ratings? Are we getting their opinion? No, I'm not getting their opinion. We would most likely have to pay for that opinion. <laughs> um. Commit, number eight, commits to not bringing forward special revenue ordinances before Q3. So administration proposes certainly bringing forward anything that is revenue neutral. So if we identify a new revenue source and we'd bring that forward, those are largely going to be our grants. Um, so we do want to bring those forward. Um, and then, of course, we will ro robustly review so that you can have confidence that a due diligence has been uh, completed on that. Because we also want to make sure with grant funding that when a grant ends, we don't have a further commitment beyond that. Um, and then we also propose, and I think Cathcart, this goes to your suggestion, of a mid-year general fund financial review. And then if there are budgetary reallocations, that we can present those to you um, at that time as well. I think that that would kind of address your concern there. Um, and part of that mid-year review also includes updated projections and includes a pre-audit, an audited closeout of 2022 so that we know how we actually ended 22 compared to the budget plan. So, um, and that's, that's great. I really wanna have that mid-year um, um, option, but What's going to happen, I guess, you know, between January and that mid-year to identify potential changes? I mean, is there going to be a study, an analysis of things we can contract out, cuts we can make, new revenue sources that we should be, you know, putting on the ballot or passing councilmatically? I mean, what, what will happen in those six months or, or so? Um, thank you, Councilmember Cathcart. I think that is part of that December discussion when we bring to you a plan. Um, of the services that, that will be under review and what that structure kind of looks like so that you can anticipate what to expect in that mid-year review. Because you would be part of that process, so it should not be a surprise of what you might see. But what it looks like right now, I, I, I don't know at this point but in time. But it wouldn't just be a mid-year review. I mean, would there would be work being done actively. Yes, oh, yes, with yes. that date being Yes, so and there may be recommendations for some adjustments. So I certainly understand the grants uh, mm -hmm. as they come through as SBOs. What I was trying to get at earlier was the unassigned reserve balance. Was there any resources uh, that was going to be able to be put into that account for that unassigned reserve, which was over 20 million, and now we're down to the bottom. So with record or increase in revenue, that we have not, or not looking at putting anything uh, back into that account and looking at uh, cutting somewhere else or, or not funding. 
I, I, just as a person around the kitchen table, times are tough and we're not putting away anything uh, coming up in 2023 uh, in preparation for uh, inflation or unexpected anything. Um, I'm just so uncomfortable that we went through so much of our unassigned balance last year with all the additional monies that came in through COVID and ARPA and other resources that there is just, we still just spent and there's nothing left over that we can't even save $500,000. That's just crazy making to me. So I just want to throw that out there. That's just my position. That um, Councilmember Wilkerson, um, I can share with you in, in my past life, we would, we would bring to council at the close out of a fiscal year because that's what determines what your final ending balance really is. It's prior year actual accumulation of unspent dollars. Um, so budgetarily, you can put something in the budget to have something set aside. It just means you're not going to spend. It doesn't guarantee, though, that you're going to put something into that kitty, so to speak. But in that mid-year review, we can bring to you what those balances are. And again, if you'd like to establish a different reserve and hold some aside, if you if you like a strategic reserve, which you have mm -hmm. established, um, if you'd like to increase the contingency reserve or increase the mm -hmm. revenue replacement reserve, that is a great time to say, yes, take some of this unassigned, unappropriated fund balance that's not, that you know what the balance is, and make this one bigger or set this aside here. So. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Please just don't bring an SBO for the roof of the city hall since we've already talked about it. So. <laughs> It took a few years of saving to get that one done. Yeah. yeah. Great. So you might notice a few different changes. I'm gonna move on to the mayor's proposed budget. Um, we used new software. This was new Questica, new caseware that actually created the book. Um, it still includes a lot of the basics, the mayor's budget message, budget summary. Um, operational and strategic proposals, we did include for you the other proposals that the divisions had that for various reasons are not included at this time, but we wanted to be transparent um, with you on those. And then financial reports and then division budget book reports are all included in there. Next steps. Um, in fact, later today will be our first meeting with the budget committee. So that takes place today. Um, the first reading of the property tax ordinance is next Monday. We have to certify by the 30th. Also, the opening of the budget hearing starts Monday for you. You'll go through several weeks of, of that and give the public opportunity to respond as well. On the 14th, you will have the first reading of the capital improvement program ordinance. And then 12-5, closing of the budget hearing and on 12-12, we hope to pass an ordinance and adopt the budget. And then, of course, administration step after that is we will run into the system and then rebalance everything so that January 1, we have a live budget system. Yeah, I got else? another one, yeah. yeah. Um, to go to the property tax ordinance, um, what's the rationale for not supporting a 1% increase and instead, I guess, going to that unallocated reserves for $450,000? Um, my understanding is the mayor's proposed to not accept the 1% um, to really, in gesture, give back to the public. But instead take from the unallocated reserves, essentially. Um, second question is, I heard the mayor this week talking about her support for increased police officers and the need for more police officers. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear that anywhere in the budget, that there's a call or a priority for more police officers. So I want to make sure that I'm understanding that correctly. Um, yes, she does support adding police officers. We have to identify funding first before we can add more police officers. But uh, she definitely... Um, supports and part of that first step um, is my understanding that her priority is definitely on patrol for public safety, which is why right now she is very supportive of Chief Meidel's change to increase patrol levels. 
All right, so no proposal for additional revenue, additional police officers. There's no proposal for that. Not at this time. All right. Thank you. Well, I'd like to know if it's going to be at any time in 2023 because I wouldn't want that surprise because we already have budgeted for the open positions now, mm -hmm. which I think are about 20, 30 uh, in the police department. And that's uh, a, a great goal that we would all like to see. But if there is no additional revenues to come in, I don't even want to be putting that out there in the community that we may be hiring more additional police officers when we know we cannot afford them or the equipment that goes with them. So to me, that's a false narrative uh, to our community to start setting that expectation that we as a city cannot deliver on. So that's just my position on that. Well, I just, we, we desperately need the more police officers, mm -hmm. but yeah, we can't afford it today. So, but we're gonna come back in six months, right? That's the goal and look at the budget again. And at that point in time, there could be a difference in the economy. There could be changes in our revenue. There could be a whole lot of things that occur and we can always consider it then. But yeah, today we don't have the revenue just sitting around to, to hire them. Um, so I would certainly agree with that. And as far as the property tax goes, people can't afford it. <laughs> I mean, we are taxing them out of their homes, literally. They cannot afford it. Done. I'm sure we'll have more talk about property taxes later, but I just want to point out the median house is an $8 increase over the course of the year. It's $8. That's ours. Add up all the others. Just keep adding. Just keep adding. Yeah, but we're only impacting ours. It's $8 for us, less than a dollar a month. All right. All right, preview, future <laughs> discussions. Tanya, thanks again so much um, for bringing this to us, and we'll look forward to more meetings. And, um, thank you, council members. Thank, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. All right, I think that brings us to the end of today's meeting. We do have, um, on Monday, double briefing session, and um, plenty of spicy things on the agenda. So plan for a long Monday. That is your uh, punishment for having an easy Monday this last week. Um, but with that, take care of yourself. If you can, take someone else. Take care of someone else. And we are adjourned. Yeah, that was the trick. <laughs> That's the trick. <laughs> Thanks for using WebEx.